Your Excellency, thank you so much for offering us this uh, first time ever interview with uh, Saudi uh, media. We are honored to be in your country. Uh, we thank you for uh, your time. And uh, we would like to start immediately from your historic visit uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, last uh, October, uh, the first ever for uh, an Armenian president since uh, the independent. And we would love it if you can give us some background uh, of how the visit came to be and the results. And most importantly, uh, when uh, do we hope for uh, official diplomatic ties to be established? First of all, uh, I greet you in Armenia. Welcome to Armenia. I'm very happy to see you. You said that it was my first, or first Arme pres Armenian president's first visit to, to Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is true. I think for a while, whatever we do between Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Republic of Armenia will be the first time. In fact, we're having the first visit in of an official news agency that comes from Saudi Arabia to Armenia. So for a while, and that's unfortunate. You say it's unfortunate that for more than 30 years of our independence, we didn't have diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. It's unfortunate for many, many reasons, but first of all, Saudi Arabia is a, a very important, very influential, and very, very prominent state, uh, a guardian of, of, of a faith of Islam. And Armenia being given a small state, but we are the first Christian state. And if we look back in our history, even the 30 years Armenians were coming to Saudi Arabia, working in Saudi Arabia, and being successful in Saudi Arabia, many Armenians from worldwide. And I think there was, according to me, there was no really a fundamental problem why we didn't have diplomatic relations. So. Instead of going back to too long, about 30 years, I will just start probably when I became president of the Republic of Armenia. And one of my first goals that I had in mind was to really establish diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. And, it, and I found a very good resonance with, with uh, His Majesty, King Salman uh, bin Abdulaziz al Saud and His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, because we started communications, writing to each other, letters be that on national, religious, or, or, or state events, and very courteous, very respectful, very deep. And that established specific relations. Eventually, in our communications, we started talking about the possibility of having diplomatic relations. And, the first understanding and agreements were, in fact, in the old style. Because in this new world, people prefer to write a text on C <laughs> or, or SMS or in WhatsApp, but this was classical, old style, beautiful letters. That, as you said, when you are uh, looking for a historic event, you have to be basically serious in your. And eventually, as, uh, as the peak of, of these communications was my uh, my visit to, to Riyadh. And I agree with you, I think we can call it historic. And for me personally, it was historic visit because uh, visiting Riyadh uh, as the President of the Republic of Armenia and starting the new page of our relations was a great privilege for me, a great honor, and also great pleasure. And I was very happy when we arrived in Riyadh. I, the first things that I saw was the um, guard of honor and uh, the flags of two republics. And I was greeted there by the state minister, uh, Adal bin, uh, bin Ahmed al Chaber, and a uh, very prominent diplomat whom I have seen many times in, in different occasions, be that in Davos or the Munich Security Conference, and uh, had small hellos and uh, discussions. Someone that I respect. And in fact, we had our first discussions directly in the airport. And we had deep discussions about, about our, uh, our relations, about how we will develop our diplomatic relations. And in fact, we spoke about the future of relations between Saudi Arabia and, uh, 
and a Republic of Armenia. And then I was in Riyadh, and I was very happy that I was present at that big, huge conference. That it was, I think, the fifth one that you are running in Saudi Arabia, which is focused on, on the future. And my discussions, although not very lengthy, with uh, His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Salman, were very specific. First of all, it was a discussion about the respect of two sides to each other, as a nation, as, as a state, as an individual as well. And then the second thing, I think, we spoke about uh, our diplomatic relations. And basically, both sides, we agreed that uh, de facto, in reality, our diplomatic relations started, starts with that visit. And I'm, I've uh, made invitations for the State Minister and Foreign Minister of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and of course to His Royal Highness to visit Armenia in the future. And of course we agreed that we are on a path of, you know, of opening embassies and sending uh, our ambassadors to each other. And the third most important part of our discussion was focused on the future. And I was very happy to find, uh, with my uh, discussions with His Royal Highness, that he's very focused into the future. Future of his country, future of the region, future of the Gulf, and future of the world. And it's not only his, because he shared with me his, his ambitions to, to develop new Saudi economy, starting from tourism up to new energy and, and so on, but also his focus on high technology, high tech, which is something that I consider it's a must for everybody, and especially for my country like Armenia, because Armenia, like Saudi Arabia, doesn't have big natural resources like oil or gas, but it has huge natural resource, which is called human resource. In, in Several very successful Gulf states like Saudi, like Emirates, or like in, in Qatar. They are investing huge amounts of money now in education, science, and technology. And that's right. Because that's the future of humanity. Be that artificial intelligence, mathematical modeling, or biotechnologies. And I found uh, in Mohammed bin Salman someone who is really focused on something that I do believe is the right thing to do. And it's the right thing to do for Armenia. Our strength, of course, is the natural high level of education and science, because we were a part of Soviet Union, and Soviet Union recognized the existence of talent here. And Soviet Union invested a lot of money in science and education in Armenia. Armenia is a small country, but has particle accelerator, electron positor. Big states in Europe, they don't have that. Big institutes of research in plasma physics, astrophysics, elementary particle physics, biotechnology, and so on. Then the, the next thing is that because it's connected with the world through its diaspora, because we have around 3 million or a bit more living in Armenia, but there are so many Armenians living outside. There are as many Armenians living in Russia as, as in Armenia, or as, as many probably in the United States. Los Angeles maybe is the second or the third Armenian city after Yerevan. Maybe the second is Moscow or maybe a, the other way around. So there is a huge Armenian community outside, three, four times bigger than the, the people, those who live here. And that's a strength because we have great names starting from international relations, politics in many other countries, scientists, artists, journalists, Nobel Prize winner, scientists, and so on. So I think that's the strength of our nation. Of course, my uh, sort of, uh, not, I will not say the agenda, my vision, my hope, my mission, I do see to make Armenia a modern 21st century state where we will be developing and, be, be, being one, and become one of the leading states in, this, in, in the world in new technologies, because that's the future. There's a presidential initiative which is called ATOM, Advanced Tomorrow. It has several components from international co conference, which is called Summit of Minds. That is a three, we had already three of them in the beautiful mountains in Armenia. I would like to invite you and your colleagues to come next one, which is in early September. That will be accompanied with a big festival of science and music, which is called Star Starmus, and will be the sixth one. We'll have 
great uh, rock musicians and also classical musicians. I mean, people like Peter Gabriel, Brian, you know, Hans Zimmer coming. Nobel Prize winners, scientists, astronauts, cosmonauts, and so on and so forth. Basically showing to the next generation that doing science is cool. And that's the future of my country. And of course, the Project Atom that has the, the target of bringing big multinational companies into Armenia into joint ventures. Your Excellency, you already answered three or four of my questions. Ah, okay. Uh, so thank you so Not much. Not all of them. Not all I of them. Yet. No, um, I, uh, you know, it's it's you making us more hungry for uh, for answers. Uh, I just want to finish on the bilateral ties. Yeah. If the, uh, was there a, a agreed date, for example, or is that now up to the institutions to establish? No, the... we didn't have an agreed date. In fact, we agreed that twenty sixth of it was twenty sixth, I, I, if I remember well, of October which you said it's an historic date. I think from starting from day, we will consider that we have these relations and we will continue. So it's up to uh, the relevant departments, the Foreign Ministry of Republic of Armenia and, uh, and the Foreign Ministry of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to have the exchange of the ministers and envoys and so on and so forth. To be honest, for me, that's also already for me secondary. Okay. Yes, what I have agreed with His Royal Highness and with the state minister, is that starting from that day, we will basically consider that we have opened a new page in our relations. And I think that's wise. Uh, I think specific date here and there, I leave that uh, to, to diplomats to agree something, to sign something. For me, the historic date is, is the 26th, when on the very, very important invitation from His Royal Highness, I visited Riyadh and we started a new page. My, uh, I'm curious about your impressions uh, about Saudi people, the youth and, and Riyadh, because one thing our country uh, suffers from is stereotypes. Some people have very outdated stereotypes. And maybe a lot of, so some of the Armenians I met uh, maybe still have an outdated image of uh, Saudi Arabia. So I'm curious to know how did it compare to uh, the reality to the imagination? Personally to me, because I'm very much interested and I have a lot of friends worldwide, be that big politicians or just friends or businessmen, because I, I myself was in business for years, or in, indeed in academia, be that in natural sciences or political sciences. So I knew about Saudi Arabia, the reality. <laughs> from many, many sources. But one thing is knowing the reality, and the other one thing is that when you arrive there, and do you like it or not, or where you were expecting or not, somehow you're a bit shocked to see that the reality is a bit further in the right direction that you were expecting. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the, the opportunity to travel and to see other places of Saudi Arabia, even in Riyadh, because everything was in in reality, in one day, in, in, in the hotel and so on. But I met a lot of people. But the, 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 the biggest and the most important factor for me is, is the discussions that I had, first of all, with His Royal Highness, with his vision, because I do believe in his honesty as, as a leader of, of the state, where he is leading his state and his nation. And that's, uh, I think, in, in the right, very right direction. And the same with, with State Minister, who is a very prominent diplomat. I think I was really satisfied what I saw, which was even me being so informed was even better or more advanced than what I saw. And also, especially when we were speaking about the future, about the future of both our nations that should be in, in new ways, new technology, new behavior. Yes, both sides, both in Saudi Arabia and in Armenia, we, we, we have to work hard in order to educate our people as well. Uh, Saudi Arabia is better known in Armenian diaspora because a lot of them being American, Lebanese, they have been visiting, doing business in Saudi Arabia. So they know better, but uh, locally here, of course, we have, because there are st stereotypes, as you said. The same is in Saudi Arabia, probably they think about Armenia in, in a specific way which doesn't have anything to do with reality. So opening doors, diplomatic relations, not only diplomatic, but cultural relations, economic relations, tourism, I mean, that will, uh, that will help. There's so much to show, 
I mean, you are visiting Armenia in the middle of January where it's cold and so on, but come in, in spring. Even now it's attractive, but come in spring. You'll find the city full of cafes, restaurants, a lot of life, a lot of culture. This is a country of thousands of years of, uh, of culture. So Armenians are one of those sort of a very old nations that lived in, the, in this area for thousands of years. And you can find that. So speaking of uh, stereotypes, and you're very right that it works both ways. So while we were researching for the interviews, when I was speaking to some Saudi journalists and academics, um, I think the biggest concern that people might have uh, is uh, Armenia's relationship uh, with, with Iran. Uh, you mentioned the, your uh, conversations with the Crown Prince and the alignment in the sense of the two countries want to look for the future. Um, you can understand why critics of Iran see it going in the opposite uh, direction and they might have a concern of the close relationship that uh, Armenia uh, has with Iran. Do you think this hinders the possibility of uh, Armenian uh, normalization, establishment of ties with you know, moderate Arab countries? No, not at all. First of all, this is not a religious state. I mean, although our church is the earliest church uh, in the world, and the Armenian Apostolic Church is, doesn't belong to Catholic or Orthodox Church, and by its theological base, it's an Orthodox, but it's a completely independent church, and it has good relations with not only all of the churches in the world, but also with with, uh, with Islam, with Buddhism, and many others. So that's the, that's the beauty of, our, of, of Armenian religious behavior, because we have the relations. Secondly, I, my experience is we have excellent relations with countries like Qatar. We have excellent relations with a country like United Arab Emirates. And this is not only, I mean, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Armenia uh, going for holiday in Dubai and elsewhere. They can now go to, to Doha as well, and there'll be football. I think there are no, even any hints of, of, uh, of difficulties there. The same is with, with Kuwait, with Bahrain and other states. Now, the same is with Egypt, because if you, you go back there, hundreds and hundreds of years back, there was a very strong Armenian community in Egypt, always, starting from the days of pharaohs, up to the development of Alexandria, where there was a very strong Armenian community until today. Even we had Armenian prime minister, one of the most famous prime, minister, prime ministers of Egypt, of Armenia, or Janubar Pasha, a gentleman that was not only the prime minister of, of, uh, of Egypt, but also established the biggest Armenian charitable organization, Armenian General, General Benevolent Union, which is now based in New York. But it's a huge organization established by the Prime Minister of Egypt, who was of Armenian origin. Not at all. Now, relations with Iran. I mean, every country has its own national interests and the specifics of relations with Iran. Uh, so the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Islamic Republic of Iran, they share the Gulf. They don't share many, many views and many, many activities. Okay? And I fully understand. But I, if you look uh, uh, on, on Iran from Yerevan, or national interests here, Iran, I will try to explain to you, Iranian-Armenian relations go back again thousands of years. There were Armenians who were kings of Persia, and Persian nobility were kings of Armenia, I mean, 1,500 years ago. But that's not the case. With modern Iran, be that before Islamic Revolution and after, Armenians always were welcomed in Iran. And even after the revolution, the, the current government in Iran, for example, didn't take the path of destroying Armenian heritage or churches. I mean, in fact, the government that they have financed the restoration of Armenian churches in Iran. In the middle of Tehran, there is an Armenian club which is called Ararat. You enter there, uh, it's different than in, in Tehran. The behavior, the, the, how, what young people can achieve, it's huge, huge, huge football pitch, basketball and tennis, whatever. Cafes and restaurants, etc. You go back to, let's say, Esfahan. Esfahan, they have kept and have supported Armenian presence which with, with a huge famous monastery and the library and so on. So we, we didn't have that tensions with Iran. That's one. Armenia-Iran relations, I think if, 
if I would, I would put them on the same weight, like choice, uh, Iran and United States. They are very complex relations. But Armenia has good relations with both United States, very good relations, and with Iran. Okay? Armenia's relations with Israel, Armenia's relations with, with, with Iran. Again, the same thing. We have relations with Iran. We have an embassy in, in, in Israel. There is, a, there is a very, very strong Armenian presence in, in Israel, and specifically in Jerusalem, a quarter of Jerusalem. All Jerusalem belongs to the Armenian church. And we cannot ignore that, I think. And we cannot uh, basically go into, into their bilateral relations while well, Armenia has to keep its relations. We are small. And we have to keep our relations with, with uh, all of our friends. Okay? They may have their differences and their conflicts, but us getting involved in that is very dangerous for, for us. Second point is that we are a landlocked country, okay? geographically. So we have four neighbors. Turkey, Azerbaijan. That one is Georgia. So that is our gateway, our gate to, to the Black Sea or, or to Russia. And the fourth one is Iran. How can any Armenian government or, or how can the state afford or not having good relations with Iran? Since the fact that there is, there is, there is no reason for that from the Iranian side. So that's another reason that I, I, I'm talking about. From that, that point of view, to answer your question, I do understand the concerns of Saudi Arabia. I do understand and I see the tensions. I do understand and I see Urania, Iran and in the Gulf and the further down, Iran and Lebanon. Okay, we see that. And I see what Saudi Arabia is doing in the region, in the Gulf and I think. But if you take the state of uh, Republic of Armenia, we have to make choices that are very specific to us. Absolutely. Because we are, as I told you, we're a landlocked state. We cannot afford, out of the four, we don't have normal relations with two. Imagine we don't have normal relations with another two. We have very good relations with Georgia. We have very good relations with Iran. Um, no, understood. I don't think it was a question of either us or them, but rather, maybe a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of the nature of these relations. Would you say, for example, that the relationship is exclusively infrastructure, energy, or with, do Iran? They, with Iran, or do they interfere in military and security policy? No, no, first of all, they don't interfere in military or security. They have their interests as well. What is happening now in the south of Armenia, of course, concerns Iran because, but we have relations one, in, in energy, yes, because it's not huge, because we get our gas from Russia and a little bit from Iran, but very little, and we sell them electricity because we produce electricity and we have excess of that. But on energy, we have much deeper relations, let's say, with the with, uh, United Arab Emirates. Emirates. Mazdar City is, is building now a new solar station in Armenia. And the airliner from Sharjah is, is planning to start, create a joint venture with the Armenian state and, and have further flights. So I think uh, what are, what are the, the, the basis of our relations? They are historic, they are political, they are somehow cultural as well. And, and I think uh, they are based on, on, on uh, both sides' uh, respect. But no military. Well, I, I haven't seen any military presence of Iranians here. What about uh, their uh, position? I haven't seen it at all. Okay. What, what about their intervention uh, in Azerbaijan? The, they're, they're talking about their being a silent supporter of uh, Armenia against uh, Azerbaijan. There's been drills, military drills on, uh, on the border. Um, isn't this considered a kind of uh, taking, uh, be taking it beyond infrastructure and energy. No, but that's their own policy. They, they, they don't interfere in Armenia. I think that whatever they feel is right or wrong, whatever is they feel as a danger happening on their borders, it's, it's their internal issue. I mean, uh, there are so many things that you can pay attention, okay, and say, but at the end of the day, the conflict that happened between 
for because of Karabakh war, the second war that we had, was basically Azerbaijan against the Armenian side of Karabakh and then a Republic of Armenia, fully supported by Turkey, and there was no Iran in the game. There was Russia, and Russia was trying to be the mediator. Eventually, they brought the, the war to a ceasefire. And now they are trying to be in the, as a mediator to, to solve post-war many, many questions that arise after the war. But there was no Iran. And to be honest, as speaking about, about relations between Iran and, and Azerbaijan, I've been in Iran years ago, not when I was, when I was a free person. And I visited also the north of Iran, Tabriz. And the one thing that I saw when I arrived in the airport in Tabriz flying from Tehran was, welcome to Western Azerbaijan. Do I have to take this or comment this or not? Obviously, the, the, the construction of nationalities living in, in the north of Azerbaijan speaks about itself. But I never took this as, as something which is sort of anti-Armenian or anything. I have a few more questions about Azerbaijan, but there is one back to perception and reality. And, yeah. you know, it might not be something that people talk about here, but in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, so there is a perception probably propagated by the Turks or the Azerbaijanis that this is a religious war. Not at all. I can just uh, give you a strong answer. Not at all. It was never, never okay, a religious war. As I said, it was not a religious war, and Armenia has wonderful relations with a lot of uh, states where Islam is, is, is the major religion, or even states where Islam the only, is the only religion, or states that have Islam as a state religion. Not at all. It was never. Okay? Azeri side sometimes liked to use that in order, in order to accumulate support from Islamic world and so on. But Armenia, Armenian side, never tried to use and to get support from Christian states because this is a Christian war. Not at all. It was never. For different, for, for, for Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh for centuries and thousands of years, this was, this was just a, their voice for their self-determination because they, they had their experience living under Azerbaijan for 70 years, under Soviet Union. Before that, they were not. Comrade Stalin gave it to Azerbaijan. So they didn't trust the Azeri side that they can live together. Even under Soviet Union, there were pressures on them. So when Comrade Gorbachev announced that uh, the, he's going to change Soviet Union and people believed him, I think there was the rise of the voice of, of, of people of, uh, uh, of Artsakh, at least that's the Armenian name, or Nagorno-Karabakh for their uh, independence from Azerbaijan. And this was, for Armenians, it was about this. For Azeri side, it was about the, the, the integrity of their state, or they have got uh, Nagorno-Karabakh for a while. They started believing that it belonged to them forever. But in reality, it was probably in real world, in real world of politics, it eventually became into much more complex. Much more complex, because Armenians, in the war early 90s, 1990s. Armenian side won the war against the same Azerbaijan. There was the support from Turkey, not so obvious, not so open, but there was the support of Turkey. Az Azerbaijan had a lot of military equipment from Soviet Union, but the Armenians were much more, uh, much more motivated because they were fighting for their own land and for their independence. And I think they were, they were also a bit ahead. They were a bit ahead of Azerbaijan in organizing their army, in organizing the converting from a, our army of volunteers into a professional army. We were a bit ahead of that. And one of the reasons, because as I said, Armenians are everywhere. They were in Soviet army generals, officers, that came back and created the modern Armenian army. And in 1994, Armenia won the war, dramatically. But then Azerbaijan got a leader who was, I would say, very visionary, strategically thinking, like Heydar Aliyev, the father of Ilham Aliyev. 
that really saw that the solution for Azerbaijan, if they stay as they are and they fight for Karabakh, they will never win. So the solution is developing their advantage, which was the oil. And his target was to create the, the pipeline that takes Azeri oil and the oil from Caspian to Mediterranean via Georgia and Turkey. And I think early 20s was the early 2000s. It was the best time to convert our victory into stable peace. Because the Azeri side was very keen to have the pipeline, even much more keen than the issue of nagorno karabakh because it was clear, without the pipeline, we are, without the oil going out, without the oil money, there would never be building a modern army. But, but as it stands, internationally, uh, Karabakh is considered Azerbaijan. Uh, so what can, uh, we, the, probably the OIC, the Gulf region, everybody has an interest to bring peace. So what, what, what position do you expect from the GCC or from the OIC to help end this conflict? Basically, I think uh, I, I, I would expect all of our friends, be that in, in the Gulf, in, in the Middle East or in Europe, to help to, to bring uh, to a logical end uh, this, this conflict. Well, they are... Uh, what would the logical end look like? I will, I will try to explain to you. I think, as I said, 26 year, years ago, Armenia was victorious, and we, we failed somehow to use the, the position of being in victory to converting that into peace, okay? Of course, taking into account the, 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 the rights of these people that live in, in, uh, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia, with their history of, of more than thousands of years. So I think... For the moment, uh, the war is, has just finished. And there are so many emotions, wounds, unresolved issues, be that starting on the borders, demarcation, and all of that stuff. And of course, the future of, 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 the, of Nagorno-Karabakh and people there. There is an internationally uh, agreed institution, which is the OSC and the Minsk Group and the co-chairs. There are still voices that I think we should go back and allow these negotiations to happen. There is a new reality where, the, where there is huge influence of Russian Federation into the regime because they were the ones that brought the ceasefire. They are the ones who are offering to help both Armenia and Azerbaijan on the border uh, demarcation and other issues related to that. Of course, there's a presence of uh, Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh today. So I would not say that issue is resolved finally, okay? Where we will get uh, and how, what will be the final re resolution, I think time will show. And that, but my advice will be, let's try to help that any solution that we will get, the final solution will be logical a solution that will be acceptable by both, both sides. Any solution which is forced will not last forever. Uh, who do you very, think? very important. This is very important. I think, as I was uh, telling you, and this is not only about the relations of Armenia and Azerbaijan and the future of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh. This is also correct in, in, in the case of Armenian and Tur Turkey relations. I think it's very important that we do that logically, respectfully, and also doing the necessary compromises. And in many cases, the side that is bigger, stronger, or victorious today, basically is the side that has to think about doing more compromises or behaving like that, because that's doing small compromises or compromises, you are building the the stable future for them. There is not much the Armenian side can compromise today. We could compromise, starting from 94, when we were victorious, and there was the land, the Karabakh, and there was the land. That was the time for us to do the compromise and to come to a diplomatic solution rather than a war solution. That's a big regret, because thousands of young lives were, were lost. 
in something that could have been achieved through diplomatic channels. Okay? In uh, an interview with France 24, uh, you welcomed the Russian as a... You are watching my interviews with France 24. <laughs> when was that one? <laughs> it, it, was earlier, uh, it was earlier this year. And I think you called the Russians a fair mediator and uh, you welcomed their intervention. Yeah. And uh, you said that, uh, you know, while the Russians are welcome, uh, Turkey's intervention in the war made things worse. Yeah. Um, the Turkish uh, interesting... Looks like I said that. I don't remember what I said. It's something, something, around, those, uh, something around those lines. Um, the Turkish uh, vice president a few days ago said something very interesting, that they are looking forward to normalizing ties. Fine. With, uh, with Armenia in coordination with uh, Azerbaijan. And uh, my question is, uh, is, does you know, Armenia welcome this? And more importantly, uh, do you take it at uh, face value? Okay. I think, first of all, the question, does Armenia welcome this? It's already a complex issue. Well, who is Armenia? Armenia inside is politically divided, especially after the war, as you can imagine every every state when you have a war and you lose the war and there are so much tensions, then it's not homogeneous in its behavior. And then I will never take the sort of a, an action saying that I'm speaking on behalf of Armenia. First of all, I'm the president of a parliamentary republic. I'm the head of state, but I'm not executive. Who runs the current affairs is the government. And it's the government that has to answer to the Turkish side and the offer. And basically, if they decide that they are happy to go ahead with that, that's fine. Okay. And then they have to, if they start the negotiations, it's, it's their business. But eventually, any agreement which is basically achieved or created should have, I think, should go through a process. Even in Turkey, but specifically in Armenia, it has to go the formal process of being brought to the, to the Parliament of the Republic, because we are a parliamentary republic. There should be public debate on this, be that on the level of NGOs or analysts or just people. And of course, any form of agreement, everything which will be supported by the Parliament as well, will eventually come to my, to my table. So it will be absolutely wrong for the head of state of a parliamentary republic to prejudge and give valuation or to, do, to say something which is just starting and has not reached my table. The moment it comes and reaches my table, you will hear my voice. And of course, as the president of the republic, I, I can either sign it, whatever is agreed, if I consider it, that is going parallel or, or in, in harmony with the national interest of the state and the people of Armenia, Armenians worldwide, which is much bigger, okay? Or I have a ch chance not to sign it, send it, for example, to a constitutional court. So the top lawyers should discuss this issue and give me advice, okay? So we're far ahead from that point. So I'm not going to comment. Uh, I will just try to, to make sense by... This is not the first time this is happening. Let's go back in 2008. There was this famous football di di uh, diplomacy, if you remember. In 2008, because of the, uh, of the, of the phenomenal uh, uh, thing which is called football, <laughs> there was, because it's an amazing, it's the most popular thing in the world, and uh, it's not only sports, it's not only cultural economy, but it has become also diplomacy. So in 2008, Armenia, for the World Cup, FIFA Cup, had to play with Turkey. And the first game was in Armenia. And then president of Turkey, which was Mr. Gul, decided to visit Armenia and to come to that game as a gesture. So we don't have diplomatic relations, but the, the Mr. Gul uh, was welcomed here by then the president of Armenia, Serge Zarksyan. And Mr. Gul came here. There was a game here. Unfortunately, Armenians, I do remember, lost 2-0. <laughs> and, and, but that was a sort of a step one to football diplomacy and the Armenian president visited the next game. As a result of that, in a year time at, in, in 2009, 
a protocols were signed in Zurich. And they were serious because that was in the presence of, of, of uh, Swiss authorities which supported that whole negotiating process in the presence of a French foreign minister, Russian foreign minister, foreign minister of the United States. Madame Clinton was there. Mr. Lavrov was there. This, was, this protocol was, was signed. I was asked by, then I was a free person, fully free. No government relations. I, it was after 97 when I was in, in as prime minister, I resigned because I had severe illness. And I had spent one and a half years in different hospitals trying to survive. And then after that, I was in my academic life running a center at Cambridge University, giving lectures here and there, and also running family business. So I was a free person, and I was asked the question, what do you think? I said, I don't believe that is going to be successful. For several reasons, but I mentioned then two of them. Because Armenia and Turkey can talk and decide things. But those days, there were at least two other players that were not taken into account. The player number three was Azerbaijan. How on earth Turkey was going to sign any relations with Armenia those days where Azerbaijan is not involved because of the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh? So in order to achieve something those days, you had to engage also Azerbaijan. But there was a fourth player as well on the Armenian side. That fourth player is the Armenian diaspora. A, mo a big part of Armenian diaspora is a result of the genocide. I mean, it's related. Their grandfathers, grandmothers basically suffered the runaway coming to California, Argentina, to Moscow, or Russia. So you could not, you cannot basically get an agreement signed by even the president of the republic if you don't take account the opinion of your nation, and specifically those who live outside, and the number of these people is a couple of times more than those who live here. So it's a very sensitive issue. As a result of this, because these protocols were signed, after that, President of Armenia visited a couple of states, like and he went to Lebanon, he went to France, and the first time in the history he was not greeted by his own fellow Armenians. In fact, there were demonstrations, I mean, strong demonstrations against him in Paris and in Beirut, showing that you did something with that. So the Armenian side, before doing something with, with Turkey, has to have a voice and to speak to diaspora. I've lived in diaspora for 30 years in several countries. I know that. So we cannot ignore that. And I think if we want to achieve something, of course, I think the best solution for Armenia would have been peace in the region, normalized relations with all of our neighbors, okay? All four of them, okay? But that takes courage, that takes pragmatism, that has to exclude emotions, but doesn't exclude history. And I think in the, in the Armenian case, or in the case, so that's why I thought that it's, I think this is not going to be successful because two key players were not involved. And it exactly happened as I was predicting. Because the sides were blaming each other that we signed this protocol, but you didn't ratify it, I ratified it, and that was the other way around. Does it start with recognizing the genocide from the Turkish no, side? No, no, it was just a, a, simple, a, a simple protocol saying we should... Uh, create a, a joint group and we should study and so Nothing very intense. But for Armenians here, and mostly for Armenians in diaspora, if you don't basically talk to them, if you don't expect, include them somehow, and any talks with Turkey, if they are sort of closed, create a lot of conspiracy theories. I mean, this is a new... But conspiracy theories were in, in the air for centuries. But now with the new fake news and everything, conspiracy theories can be huge, hugely positive, or hugely negative. Okay? So there, there were other reasons that I thought that that the court of 2009, the football diplomacy, and this was a diplomacy. Huh? Now what we have, we had the aftermath of a, aftermath of a, of a, of a war. I mean, thousands of lives are lost. There are high emotions, the victorious emotions in Azerbaijan, 
and the unhappy emotions in Armenia and in diaspora. I think it's a very emotionally sensitive moment to jump into, into building up relations. I'm trying to be someone who doesn't fell a victim of emotions. Okay? Although my family, my grandparents, well, my, my father's side uh, were, were from, uh, from Erzurum, and they ended up in Russia, and so on. My mother's side were from Bitlis and Alashkert, ended up having properties and big presence in Istanbul, and ended up eventually in Armenia, and so on. So I think every Armenian family has this, but it doesn't mean that you can be a, vict a hostage of your history, but you cannot ignore the history. So there are two things. You cannot be a victim of it, a hostage of it, but you cannot also ignore it. So you have to be pragmatic, less emotions, and today is a very emotional moment. Both for us there is because they are overhyped. They forget that any victory or any loss is a function, like in mathematics of time. The victories with the time go down, and Winston Churchill's lose after the victory <laughs> and election. <laughs> and, and basically, if you are down there, are depressed because of the loss, if you work hard, you revive yourself like Germany or Japan. So everything is function of time. Is it the right time? Is this the right suggestion? I don't want to judge, as I said, because as the president of the republic, I have to be very pragmatic and basically someone that is there to, to act only on the basis of national and state interests. When it reaches me, you will hear from me. Otherwise, you didn't hear from me today. <laughs> um, Pakistan uh, has, uh, seems to have a very close relation with Azerbaijan yeah. and Turkey uh, on uh, your border. How does that affect your... Uh, well, badly. Badly, non-existent. No, badly, because again, with Pakistan, we don't have diplomatic relations. To be honest, I'm trying to build them. Because it's, I think, I don't come from, from the concept that if somebody supports my, my competitor or the enemy, I shouldn't talk to him. No. I think one of the reasons that Pakistan is closer to Azerbaijan, doesn't have any relations with us, we have our role there, a negative role, what's happening. The moment you build relations, diplomatic relations with Pakistan, having connections, exchanges, and maybe their position towards the Caucasus will be a bit different. I think you can always blame the other side, but I think you have to look deep into issues and give an uh, opportunity to basically change these relations. Well, uh, I'm thinking how, what we, how we can do that, our relations, because Pakistan is not a country that you can ignore, okay? I think especially in our region, especially what you are saying, there's open support to, to Azerbaijan and Turkey, how you can ignore that. We are not in a position of going in a war against <laughs> Pakistan. That's a complete nonsense, of course. We should try to have a dialogue and see where it takes us. And I don't see any, again, contradiction between having a dialogue with Pakistan and our deep and good relations with India. We have very deep, very good historic relations. Armenians lived in India for thousands of years. I mean, really thousands. I want to speak about, uh, you're mentioning the diaspora, and um, probably an issue closer to heart, which is Lebanese Armenians. Uh -huh. As you know, Lebanon is going through a very difficult yeah. Uh, period and um, it's very interesting that now history has reversed itself so Armenians fled to Lebanon at, at one point created the community there now there seems to be reverse uh, yeah. migration to Armenia and there's large numbers yeah. of Lebanese and Lebanese Armenians coming here I wanted to know whether maybe there's a, an initiative well to help Lebanon and to help yeah. Lebanese Armenians coming to coming back to Armenia yeah I think you said, uh, you asked one question, probably I'll answer that to another three. I think, first of all, it takes me an opportunity to thank Arab world generally and the Middle East, and including the, the Gulf, for what you did more than 100 years ago when Armenians were fled, fleeing their homes. And they, they found their homes in Syria, they found their homes in Lebanon, in Egypt, 
in the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia. And I, I take this opportunity to thank the nations and the heads of states of these uh, all Middle Eastern states, especially Arab states that were so brotherly to us. Okay? And these are states where the, 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 basically the main religion is Islam, or the only religion is Islam. And they took, took Armenians, homeless Armenians who are Christians, okay, as their brothers and sisters. So that's an opportunity to thank them. Now, uh, about what is happening in the Middle East, it's, it's in some places, it's as tragic, tragic as what happened in Armenia with the Karabakh war. Take Syria. I mean, it's not only about the war, the loss of lives, intervention from here, from there, but also we as Armenians are, are losing huge cultural basis for us. I think that, I think... Things happening, they have logic. Okay? 26 years ago, we won the war, Armenian side, Karabakh war. So you had, the Armenian side had 26 years to basically convert, as I said, the victory into stable peace. The moment you don't do that, you'll be punished. Okay? And we saw what, what's happening. Now, in the case of Lebanon, you cannot mount a national state date in that sort of a caliber and hoping that a magic will happen. I'm not speaking about the structure of the nation. I don't, I'm not speaking about the changes in Sunni, Shia, Maronites, and others. No, I'm speaking about just the finances of the state. You cannot expect a state accumulating on that sort of a scale of a, of a debt, and then expect that nothing will happen. It's happening today. And I have a lot of friends there. I had long discussions in Glasgow at the, at the, at the climate conference with, with the prime minister, who is a good friend, Najib Mikati. I know the family for many years. His brother, they are prominent businessmen. And he's honest. There is not much they can do these days. And coming back, before answering your question, I'm answering another third, fourth one. Take Armenia and Turkey. During the war that we lost, okay, Armenian drum, I mean monetary unit, unit, was stable. It lost a little bit. And after the war, it gained, it became stronger than, than, than before uh, compared with dollar, US dollar. But the Turkish lira went down dramatically, and we know that. I mean, Turkey and the president they are facing huge problems because of the economy. And that has huge impact on internal affairs, internal politics, and so on and so forth. And of course, President Erdogan thinks strategically, but has the ability of changing himself because there's like another uh, function of time changing himself, maneuvering, because the economy is in bad shape, the lira is down, while Armenian drum in this small economy was stable all the time. Why? Because there's something that we did right. Early 90s, we built our banking sector. Around the early 90s, we had more than 150 banks and so on, like in every Soviet republic. Most of them were pyramid schemes. But we managed to bring international banks, and first of them was HSBC. I'm proud to say I brought them here. They were the first, Army was the first country they came in. And they helped us to build our laws into banking sector. And in Armenia, we have a central bank that is really independent from the, from, uh, from the government and from its independent body. I cannot say about others, uh, the departments, or because our constitution is not right. We have to change it. But in the case of Central Bank, we got it right. And then we had a lot of international banks following immediately that Credit Agricole, Lebanese Bank, Greeks Bank, and Russian banks, and so on and so forth. So the banking, banking sector is solid. If tomorrow His Royal Highness will ask me, is, what are the sectors that, uh, that 
Saudi Arabia can invest. Among others, I, I will definitely say the financial sector, which is a healthy bank, and also high-tech sector. Okay? There are others, but agriculture, mining, and so on. But we have a solid banking sector because our central bank is really independent, unlike Turkey. You cannot have stable lira when your bank is not independent and makes its own policies. Okay. Since I spoke of, um, on, the, on the fourth one, which is our constitution, uh, you probably have heard, not from France 24, but maybe from Russian television, that I made it clear that we have to change our constitution. We have to go back in a balanced constitution, which is not balanced now, okay? Not at all. Because the moment the political party has a majority in the parliament, they control everything. They control the government, many institutions, legal issues, the, the courts, not the central bank, and not me, not the presidential. But we have to go to, uh, to a constitution which, is, uh, which has checks and balances, preferably to a presidential one. Why? Because mentally people really don't understand. We are not Germany. We are not Austria. I mean, we are not very different. We're, there's a lot of European culture here. But ordinary people, they don't understand how on earth the president is, is not sacking a minister. Because that's not my job. I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the state. There are issues that are concerning me, but not ministerial one. I don't appoint them. I appoint them, but on a recommendation of prime minister. Well, if there's something wrong with the guy, we can debate and so on. But generally, it's not my business. Is the government's business, but we have to change the constitution. Okay, now coming to your question. <laughs> I mean, your question is definitely we have to try to do something, and I think the most important will be to support our Armenian community in Lebanon, that they will stay there, because the values they have created in Lebanon are so important, and, and I think it will be absolutely wrong that they will leave that. I've been in Lebanon many times. It's an amazing country. I was there early 90s. This was like Nagasaki, like after a nuclear bombing, I mean, the whole city was destroyed. And then you had, you had families, like I got, uh, you had the prime minister that started Solidaire and they built up the Rafi Kariri that I knew him well. So they have restored, restored the building and then the, we know the history. But that was not Armenia-Azerbaijani conflict. Or this was a conflict inside every building. There were buildings that half of the building were Christian, half of them were, were Muslim, and they were killing each other. But if, if we forget today, go back five or 10 years ago, that was a country that was living somehow in harmony. Of course, there was interference there. But what they got wrong is on their financial side, why? Because of the structure of the constitution and the way they, run, they were running their affairs. And as, as a result of that. But I would love to help Armenian community there so they will stay there. Because there is too much culture, too much presence, and they are important for Lebanon. They are important for the balance of the import. So the same is with Armenian communities in many places, other places. Even if they are small. Even in a Singapore, 100 people, if they can do that sort of a contribution, if they can do contribution in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I am happy for that. Because that's my strength, small state, global nation. And my target is also to change the constitution, because by constitution, an Armenian from abroad cannot become a minister unless he lives four years, the last four years, only in Armenia and carries only an Armenian passport which I consider a complete nonsense. In this new world, basically we have people who have global experience in their lives. The same is with president. Six years living here in a village, not knowing what is happening in the world. It should be the other way around. You have to bring people that are so successful worldwide. I give this example. There are hundreds of them, thousands of them experienced people, and we're not using them. I mean, imagine a Gulf state that decided not to use oil. We're a country like that. Our oil is our people worldwide, and we're not using them effectively. 
So that's why I want to change the constitution. Um, your, in your recent trip, you also went to the Emirates. Uh, yeah. And uh, you have a, also a good relationship with, with Qatar. Uh, yeah. There's a talk about uh, Air Arabia uh, creating a hub here. We want to know about the latest uh, achievements uh, between... No, the, the latest achievements is, is very close brotherly relations with both nations. It is a classical example, despite the differences that Emirates and uh, the Qatar had to each other, it's not something that is considered to me. The only thing is that is considered to me if I can be helpful to resolve their differences or I can be the messenger of goodwill, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, there's no reason why I have to choose between Emirates and Qatar. There is no reason for that. So I have excellent relations with our friends in, in, in Emirates and different Emirates there, okay? Specifically with, with the leader of the country, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and his, his brothers and so on. And I have the same way, very close relations with the Altani family and the current, current Emir, Tamim Altani and Father Emir, Sheikh Hamad. And I don't see any reason. So Armenia should have relations with all of them. No, absolutely, but I was talking more about the project. So there's the aviation project with... Uh, with no, the project is that I think, you know, we were, we were thinking in, with both countries, we're also speaking about high tech and technology. Why? Because that's a priority for me wherever I go. I go to France, you say I'm, I'm, I'm talking to big French companies. I go to Germany, I speak to Siemens, to Munich Technologically. Even I go to Israel, I go to university in Technion because they are one of the best universities in technologies in the world. I go to America, is the same. I go to Russia, is the same. I go to Moscow State University, speak to the biggest uh, IT companies in Russia, because that's the future of Armenia. And I would love, Armenia is a small place, and I would love states from the Gulf investing in Armenia, investing in sectors that could be doing benefit for them. When Bano, and one of the benefits could be very simple. Armenia is a member of uh, Eurasia Economic Union. And in fact, the only state that also has deep relations with the European Union. We have signed with them a deep agreement of cooperation, but we're a member of Eurasia Economic Union. Basically, what does that mean for a Gulf company? They register their company here. They run their businesses from here, which is a friendly environment, nice sort of a modern, very close to fly, two and a half hours flying from here to Doha, to, to Abu Dhabi or the Dubai and further down, I hope. But then you can run your business because there are no tax differences, there are no customs duties between Armenia and Russia, Armenia and Kazakhstan, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, Armenia and Belarus, and also those countries with, that are willing to go into customs and tax uh, relations. Then there are several countries, including Singapore, has, has made desire that they want to have deeper relations with Eurasia Economic Union. So Armenia can be a gateway there, one. The other thing is, I said, I think if I, uh, I was asked where to invest in Armenia, I would say science and technology and high tech. Well, I hope that you will have time to see one of our high tech things. We're hopefully going to that. And banking, you said. Yeah, but also agriculture. Armenian food is very, very healthy because we're, we're not using uh, chemicals. I mean, Armenia is as rich as Saudi in oil. Armenia is rich in, in water. And that's natural water. I mean, the water that even in the Gulf states you drink, mostly that water is the desalinated water. I mean, the moment when you desalinate, then you have to add some minerals there to get a tasteful. For me, I can taste different waters, like some people in France, they have, see the differences in different wines. But for me, I, the same is the water. Armenia has fantastic water. For agriculture, that's why the fruits and vegetables is the clear continental climate, very cold winter, but very hot summer. And we're fantastic water. And this is a water that we can share as well.
I think in reality, uh, half a liter of water is more expensive than half a liter of, uh, of an oil. It should be. Yeah. I think you earned yourself some water, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. You too. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much uh, for your time. This has been uh, great. Thank you very much. And have another nice day or two here and then have a nice trip back home. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. Take, take with you my best regards to, to the kingdom. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you.